Okay, now let's see. Yeah, she said the CWL male is the right one. Okay. So over here. Okay, let's see. Let me make sure. Security. Uh, allow participants to chat, rename themselves, mute, and annotate, remove participant report. Okay. Um, more. I just hit resume recording. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so deciding what to grow. Again, you have to take into consideration the space available and the crop production itself. So you want to grow vegetables that are going to return a good nutrition for the time and space they require. Uh, you need to figure out again how many of each plant will fit in the bed that you have and then trellis vines it well whether you're in a small garden or, or a larger garden. And if you take a look at this uh, slide, you can see the trellises that we built um, out at the food bank. And we just used two by fours and four inch wire fencing, nothing fancy, and literally just leaned it up against the fence. And I think we've got um, maybe some squash growing there, maybe some cucumbers growing there. So the vines themselves grow up that uh, trellis. And then some of the fruit will be on top of the trellis, but some of it will fall through and hang down. Yes. You said to use wire mesh. Yeah, for four the inch trellis. wire. Uh -huh. uh, does that get hot enough to burn the, the plants? We didn't experience that. Do you remember that, Mary? No, we no problem whatsoever. No, we, I don't think we had any problem with that. Okay, so you, um, for your beds, you want to interplant fast maturing crops with longer maturing crops. So you can uh, plant radishes in between your tomatoes. You can plant collards in between your tomatoes. The collards will actually keep the soil moist and a, a little cooler. And then personal preference. Grow what your family will eat. My father-in-law grew tons of tomatoes. No one in the family ate tomatoes. <laughs> okay, well, he just liked to grow tomatoes. Okay, uh-oh, Vince, what happened? It's not, it's not going down. There you go. Okay, so this brings us to uh, companion planting. And there is a handout, I believe you got a handout on companion planting. And the idea here is that certain combinations of plants and flowers and uh, herbs, if you plant them closely together, they're mutually beneficial. So some of the benefits are it, uh, the planting together influences uh, growth and yield. It can enhance flavor. I've never tried, but some people have said that if you plant basil with tomatoes, that the tomatoes will have a better flavor. And it definitely helps with uh, pest control. We interplanted marigolds with our tomatoes and all of the aphids popped on the marigolds, destroyed them, but we did not have any aphids on our tomato plants. So. That really does work. Um, a good example of companion planting is the old Three Sisters Garden where you plant corn, corn beans, and squash. And the corn, of course, provides the tall stalks for the beans to grow on. 
the bees can capture the atmospheric nitrogen and convert it uh, so the other plants can get it from the soil. And then the squash provides shade and retains soil moisture. Now you might wonder, uh, well, I want to plant these two plants that it says don't like each other. You can do that. Just plant them far apart and they'll be fine. The idea is you don't want to plant uh, something next to the tomatoes that the tomatoes hate. So that's the situation with companion plants. And here is an example from uh, the food bank garden where we have tomatoes planted and we have our marigolds planted here and there in between. Okay, we kept a uh, bed history, uh, what we did uh, when we planted. So we had quite a few beds at this time. So you want to note the crop that you're planting, like um, the bush beans, the variety that you planted, when you planted it, and we put what kind of fertilizer we use. Rocket fuel is just another one of the all-round organic fertilizers, and it not only has those three main nutrients, but it also has some of the micronutrients that you need. And then the rate of application, how much did we put? with each plant. So you probably, well, let's see. So you probably want to keep a record of this. Okay, when you're planting seeds, um, you may have to add some organic compost to the row. Uh, depends on what year you're in and how much you've already added. Uh, before you plant, uh, slightly moisten so you're not planting in really dry uh, ground. Make a shallow indention in the middle of the row, sprinkle the seeds according to package instructions. In general, uh, for seeds, you're gonna plant them one and a half times the size of the seed deep. And lightly cover the soil and pat it gently so you've got those seeds in place and then water them very gently. You don't want to have a big stream of water because you don't want to wash your seeds away. Thinning your seedlings. None of us want to do that, but you need to do it. Um, and you need to do it to allow room for proper growth. Remember the size of these plants at maturity. It uh, thinning also reduces uh, competition for water and nutrition. And your plants need good air circulation around them. Uh, it avoids some of the diseases and uh, they just will grow better. You're gonna usually thin them when the first one or two sets of true leaves appear. And about that time, they're gonna be maybe two to three inches tall. It's better to, to if you're gonna pull the, the uh, seedlings, it's better to do it with the soil damp. That way you're not gonna disturb the roots of the plants that you leave. Um, you can also just take a pair of scissors and cut them off at the ground. And usually root crops are gonna to need to be thinned and things like carrots, turnips, to radishes. Larger seeds, you can go ahead and space in your row uh, at whatever spacing the package gives you, but keep in mind that you're not gonna be guaranteed 100% germination. So all of them may not come up. Mulch. Uh, this is a picture of a, a bed at Mary Shore Woods. And uh, she has used pine needles, I think. Is that right, Mary? So she used pine needles for her mulch. And you do want to use mulch because it will increase your yield by conserving moisture, regulating the soil temperature, and it prevents weeds. Now, it won't prevent all the weeds, but it does a really good job. And uh, put that mulch fairly thick. 
Yeah, this is the first time I've tried the pine straw, but I like the idea that it's easy to pull back when I want to, you know, check on the drip irrigation or if I need to scratch in a little fertilizer around the plant or whatever. So it's, you still get the coverage and the everything, but then it's, you can tell where it is. Okay, if you get straw, if you buy straw, uh, make sure that it's clean and has no ants or any other kind of bugs in it. Now, your garden harvest record. This is our record, and we were interested in how many pounds of each uh, vegetable that we grew um, we had produced because we needed to keep a record for ourselves and we needed to keep a record for uh, the food bank. So uh, we had our vegetables going down and then our dates across the top and then the, the pounds that we picked on that particular date with the total um, at the end of the season for uh, that particular plant. And then at the very bottom, we had totals for each of our plants, but also a grand total of how many pounds for that. Uh, so this was for fall. Now your bed maintenance, these are the things that you need to keep in mind that you're gonna to have to do on a pretty regular basis. So you wanna water deeply. Uh, don't do any shallowing water because that will keep your roots up on top and you want them to uh, go down into the ground. You'll have better plants, stronger plants. Water deeply, but do not overwater. Check for signs of underwatering, things like yellow or brown leaves or leaf drop, wilted foliage, curled leaves. And at that time too, you can also check for pests because some of these will indicate pests also. Weed frequently. We know from experience that weeds can get away from you if you're not on top of it. So weed frequently. And again, check for signs of disease, abundant leaf drop or wilt, uh, might be one sign and stunted or deformed uh, leaf growth. Harvest frequently. Don't let your produce sit there because one thing is it will get so big that it's not at peak perfection. And uh, the other thing is if you harvest frequently, it will produce more. Okay, for integrated pest management, uh, IPM. I don't know whether you all have covered that yet but you always want to use the least toxic method out there to control your disease or your pests or whatever. We um, did not use chemical controls at all. We tried to use cultural um, practices. So that would be like your companion planting, your proper watering, your introduction of beneficial insects. Or the mechanical control, which is just picking those bugs off, using a strong water spray to wash them off, or if the plant is severely damaged, remove it. But when you remove it, have a bag ready, put it in the bag, tie the bag up, and put it in the garbage immediately. You want to uh, be sure that you're not going to spread uh, whatever, whatever the problem is. Chemical controls, applying insecticidal soap, that's kind of okay. Applying pesticides only as a last resort, and I would say yank the plants out rather than putting anything chemical. Uh, for the bugs, you need to learn, learn to identify beneficial bugs and harmful bugs. So get a good book on this, and we will show you um, I believe four books that will help you in identifying. And we still go back to that book because we'll say, what is this bug? And we don't actually know. So we use those books and also learn to live with a certain amount of bad bugs. We, um, we had damage to our broccoli 
plant leaves and it was, you know, some worm or another, but the damage wasn't horrendous. So we just left them and it never harmed the broccoli itself. And I think we have the same thing with our cabbage. And encourage pollinators. So do that by planting some flowers and bring in those bees and, and parasitic wasps and whatever else that will help you control um, your bug, bad bug population. Insect problems. Basically, there are two kinds of insects that are gonna, gonna bother you. They're the sucking insects and the chewing insects. So here's a whole list of um, possible insects that will dam cause damage. And the controls on the right-hand side are pretty much organic controls. Uh, we had aphids and quite a few of these will suck juices from the stems or the leaves or just flat dab eat the leaves off. Uh, and you can use ladybugs. You can use the insecticidal soap and we use marigolds. Stink bugs suck the juices from the stems and you hand pick them and crush them. Leaf hoppers suck juices and leaves. So you can see most of these are gonna be sucking your uh, juices from your stems and your vines. And uh, so you wanna try and bring in uh, ladybugs. You can use citrus oil and you can use a strong blast of water for those leaf hoppers. The squash bugs, um, you're going to pick those off. We didn't put that down, but hopefully the birds will get them. And uh, sometimes the assassin bugs will come in and get those. White flies, you know you have them if you shake the plants and a cloud of white comes up. Um, you can use the citrus oil if it's a big problem, or you can make the manure compost tea and use that. Thrips I've had the, some luck, Mary, uh, Carol, also with uh, the insecticidal soap. Okay, for the white flies? Yeah. Okay. And for the thrips, um, you, they cause those uh, little silvery speckles or the streaks on leaves. And, you know, we didn't, honestly, I think the only thing we ever had of any consequence were the aphids. And we did have the white flies a little bit some of the chewing ones, but uh, we didn't have the thrips, but you can use garlic tea or neem to control them. We didn't ever have any scale, uh, but you can use like horticulture oil or plant oil products and spider mites. Um, didn't have any of those, but they're gonna suck the juice from your leaves. They're gonna leave silvery little things or yellow covered with, uh, the leaves will turn yellow covered with a fine web and you can use citrus oil spray on that. Am I doing this one? I think I am. All right, they're chewing insects. And again, we try and use um, organic controls. Uh, tomato horn worm, we've never had out there, but my neighbors had it and they chew big holes. Um, in your fruit and just pick them off, drop them in a pot of water. You're covered. Before you go on, someone was asking to explain the manure tea. Can you talk about that? Yeah, you can get, you know, in the past, I've used horse manure and um, I, so it's a layer of horse manure, a layer of um, straw uh, and water. And you let it sit for roughly 14, 15 days. Um, and then you can, um, I had a spigot on my container. So I just put some into the container and diluted it maybe by half. And then my mother used to use uh, cow manure and water and just let it sit and then use the water off of it. I mean, it's very good. Yeah, it's, it's uh, it's actually a good um, fertilizer also. So, um, so cutworms, you know, they're gonna cut the plants off at or below ground level and um, you can bake them with cornmeal. 
just regular cornmeal. I think there is a particular kind you can buy at a nursery, but regular cornmeal will work just fine. And uh, just, you can place it in second bowl. And uh, then you can also do crop rotation. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And cabbage worms, chew holes in the leaves of cabbage, collards, broccoli flower, bro broccoli, and um, just pick them off, drop them in a can of water. Or hopefully the birds will come, or use VT, that bacillus uh, thuringiensis, um, which you can buy. And I know I know some of uh, people use um talking about the sunken bowls, they put beer in the sunken bowls and place it in the garden and slugs and stuff go to the beer and drown. And I mean, that's a good option also. Yes, it is. And so some of the other pests are the snails and the slugs and they're gonna leave ragged holes and are the seedlings themselves be totally gone. Uh, so you can use coarsely crushed hot peppers or diatomaceous earth is also very good to use or the citrus oil spray. Uh, the animals, well, we had possums and rats and um, <laughs> <laughs> you can have possums, raccoons, rats, mice. So the food bank put these big traps for the rats and um, we just had to share with the possums because they would just come along and they would, they would take a big bite out of our very best tomatoes, but they would only take one bite out of that one, take a bite out of the next one that was really good. So we started uh, waiting and letting the tomatoes ripen slightly, and then we would go ahead and pick them and uh, let them ripen that way because the uh, the possums were getting too many. So, but in your home, at your home, you can use a trap and, uh, and can actually catch them. And this is just uh, some pictures, you may have already seen this one of uh, the cabbage worm damage where the leaves are all eaten and the tomato horn worms where the holes are in the tomatoes and the leaf hoppers sucking all the juice out. Um, and uh, the aphids, uh, you can't really see them that well on the plants, but uh, use your marigolds and you'll see bunches of them in there. And that down in the far right corner are the tomato hornworms. And you just, they're pretty big. So just grab them, drop them in a can of water. Okay, Mary. Hey. Okay, so I know that y'all um, have already had um, someone talk about all of this, so I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on it. And it's probably also a big learning curve for me uh, as a fairly newbie gardener. Um, but um, I will talk a little bit about the, the nematodes, which, um, I mean, it's a bug, but it's a little worm that in, gets into the roots and... Um, so the, the crop rotation is really good. Tomatoes are especially prone to them, but there are other, there's a multitude of kinds of nematodes. Um, not all of them are harmful. Some are actually good, but they're, they're, they can reproduce uh, probably over like a 25 day period. So the diatomaceous earth is one thing. Um, you can also do the solarization um, and we'll show you a, a little bit about that in a minute. And the, um, another thing is planting cover crops when you're not growing there. Um, but and the thing you have to be with all of this uh, kinds of things, be very careful of spreading uh, from one plant to another or one area to another. So like you, it can get, you know, if it's a, if you're more like in the ground kind of stuff rather than a raised bed, if you're walking on the dirt, you can take it from one area to another. Um, so with all of these, like if you see a, a bad section, you're gonna cut out of a plant that's got, looks like it's got some fungus growing in an area or some, if you, you take those leaves off 
and you're using your clipper to do it, then you need to um, use either alcohol or a 10% bleach solution before you make another cut any place else with that uh, device. So let's see if I'm gonna. You want me to do it? Yeah, it's not working. There it goes. Or did you do it? You did it. So this just shows, uh, and this is actually a nutrition deficiency. This is what the blossom end rot looks like. It's not always that horrible looking. Sometimes it's smaller. And sometimes you can actually, you know, cut it off and the rest of the tomato will be fine when you harvest it, but prefer not to have that happen, right? And this is just showing the same thing on uh, watermelon and powdery mildew. This is showing it on cantaloupe. We had it in the squash uh, at the food garden. Um, you know, it's, it gets humid and, and then it starts spreading from one plant to another. So as soon as you see it, get rid of it. Uh, as same, like Carol said, you, um, you need to stick it in the bag and get it out of there or it's going to, the, it'll spread around. Um, black rot, bacterial wilt. I think um, the woman from the uh, AgriLife may have shown you on the bacterial wilt. Um, there's a, if you cut a stem and there's a, a sticky goo that runs out instead of what it looks if you put it in water and then you see this just terrible stuff coming down. Um, that's one of the, the things that you'll see. So you can go next. So as I was saying, the cleaning your garden tools with the 10% bleach solution or alcohol, uh, there are resistant varieties to some of the diseases. Um, with tomatoes, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you look for the ones that are the resistant varieties, and that will be um, shown in some of those uh, guides that we were talking about. Um, planting at the right time, obviously, if um, can make a difference, and the the weeds can spread things as well. Um, so keeping those weeds out, that's a, has been an ongoing struggle at the food bank because there's um, a field nearby that is not mowed often and there's every weed you can think of over there that blows into the food bank garden, plus Bermuda grass. So that's one that we've had to work out a lot there. Um, removing the diseased or damaged plants, the companion plants, the beneficial insects, and that can be ladybugs, and there's uh, parasitic wasps and lace wing. Um, lace wings are some of the things of those beneficial insects. The airflow is a, is a big thing. Uh, I planted um, cucumbers the first time this last year and um, planted them too close together and I had a lot of problems with those. Um, so that's a, uh, and with tomatoes, the, there you can see videos on YouTube about thinning out areas of it in order to um, ensure that there's uh, airflow even within a plant, even when they're spaced well enough apart. Uh, and the doing the water and fertilizer properly and the mulch will also, if you're mulched, if you do have any splash from your water, it's not gonna send spores up onto your plants. Uh, so next, Carol. Um, we've talked a little bit about the watering already, but that really that deep watering rather than the surface watering is really what you need. Um, and gently, uh, we're gonna show you some about drip irrigation here in a second in a video. But you, yeah, you want to do, you like if you're using a handheld hose, you want it to be like on the shower setting, not on a hard stream. And you want to put it down to the soil and not, you know, wet the whole plant. And, you know, not have on like a sprinkler system that's going to run water all over the, the whole plant. Uh, when you're doing 
the seeds or the transplants when they're young, you really have to look at those probably every day and uh, see if they need water. Yeah, especially here, no matter almost the time of year. It's, I, I've, been, I've got, um, just put some transplants in uh, a few days ago um, of kohlrabi and um, uh, some bok choy. And I'm having to go out every day even though they're mulched to look and make sure that they're, um, and I don't know if you have one or not, but um, it's a little hard with the transplants when they're really little, but if you have a, um, a water meter, that's really a good thing to have to make sure that um, you're watering deeply enough. So you can water, go away for a little while and use that water meter to see if you've penetrated deeply enough into the soil. Uh, underwatering, um, you see those, the signs there, but it's interesting that you can also see some of those si same signs with overwatering. So that's why using that soil um, water meter is really a good idea. Uh, so for the next one. Okay, this is a video and Carol's in it and she's going to show us about drip irrigation. Before um, I, we turn it on, I was just going to say a couple of things to remember. Uh, there are several places to get this. Um, there used to be turf and irrigation here where you could buy a lot of stuff, but um, you know, Lowe's, Home Depot will have some things. There's some um, online places. I used a place called Drip Depot to order a bunch of stuff. And um, there's some other irrigation companies in town where you can buy through. So you wanna go ahead and start it, Carol? demonstration of one way to put in an irrigation system uh, for your bed. This one will be uh, attached to your outdoor faucet. So the one thing you will need are is the tubing that has the emitters. So these little pieces. And that comes in, I think, either a 12 inch or an 18 inch length. You also need tubing that has no holes in it and this will carry your water out to your bed. So the first thing that you're going to attach to your faucet is this backflow preventer. You should have one on every one of your faucets that are outside anyway. The next thing is a splitter and uh, you can use a splitter if you're going to need to attach maybe another hose to the irrigation system cell. So you attach that. Next will be a irrigation filter and that will attach um, to your, oh, here we go, will attach to your splitter. That's what I dropped a minute ago. So let's see. So that attaches, it's kind of a hard to attach it. So that attaches there. Next would be um, a timer if you want to use one. And that's going to attach to your filter. And next is a pressure regulator attaches to the end of your timer. If you're not using a pressure regulator, then you would attach it just to your filter. Okay, next is um, if you're not using a timer. If you're not using a timer, it will attach directly to the filter. Next is a compression couple, coupler and your black tubing that's going to take the water out to your bed. So you're attaching that to your pressure regulator. Okay, if your black tubing is going out to your bed and it needs to make a turn, then you will need an elbow to put on it to take it the direction you need to go. All right, once you get it out and you're ready to put in your tubing that goes, that carries the uh, water to the bed itself and through the emitters, 
you need to get a compression tee so that you can attach your tubing in pieces and then attach your emitter tubing out to your beds, to your uh, rows. So once you have all that in, you're going to need a way to stop the water flow. And there are two ways you can do that. You want to uh, stop it from your black tubing and you will attach a, a compression fitting that you can put a cap on and that will stop the flow. Or you can take your end of your black tubing with a figure eight fitting, bend it and put the other end through and that holds it like that. And you do the same thing with your uh, emitter tube. If you're gonna do that, be sure you've left enough on the very end that doesn't have emitters. And that's a simple way to do it. So whichever, um, wherever you go and start with your drip irrigation stuff, you will need to keep using the same brand because they have different ways of, um, you know, little proprietary things that make it not work with other stuff. So once you choose one, stay with that one. Um, I didn't have a hose that was convenient to use, but I do have an in-ground irrigation system. So I dedicated a zone of my in-ground ir irrigation system uh, and brought it up out of the ground there and then uh, started attaching all those things that Carol showed you. Uh, and I have actually, it goes um, out of the ground and then up to one bed and then it uh, goes on and then it goes on again and goes up onto a raised bed and then runs to a, a third place. So, um, and then it, I've run it the length of my longest bed on the, a raised bed that's made out of wood that was in that picture with the mulch. Uh, I've run it along the, the, the long edge because I have dividers in that bed, so I couldn't run it the long way and make it work. So, and then I bring them across the bed, across each one of each section is three feet by four feet, and I ran them across. So, it, there's a lot of ways to do it, but um, there and there's a lot of good good videos in addition to the good video that uh, that Carol just showed you um, on how to do it. Um, these are some of the useful books. This is that bug book, um, which is really good, and also this Texas fruit and vegetable gardening uh, is a good resource. And if you want to go to the next slide. And the, the Texas insect book is also good. And then this one I'm very familiar with. I did the um, uh, training that the advanced training that they offer in vegetable gardening last year. Uh, I'd like to do it again now that I know a little more. And this was a book that they gave us. And it is, it's kind of uh, old. It's been updated a little bit, but it's very comprehensive and I found it very, very useful. So next slide. Yeah, solarization is a way of producing, reducing um, weeds or uh, the nematodes or other insects and soil borne diseases. And so basically you're just using the sun uh, to pasteurize that upper layer of soil. So it really only works in the hot summer. So the first thing is, you know, getting as, as much weeds out as you can in your old plants and then till everything really, really well. Um, and you have to irrigate if it's too dry. And then if you're doing that or just in a raised bed, you know, you'll just fork it up. Um, it's and the soil has got to be moist for the solarization to work. So once you get it watered pretty well, and then you cover it with the clear plastic, uh, one to six mils, uh, which you can get um, usually at you know one of the big box stores, Home Depot or, or Lowe's. 
and you got to pull it tight and then get the edges down because what you, um, uh, you don't want it to blow off, but it's also got to be tight enough for that heat to be retained underneath there. Um, so there's, you may have seen, I'm not sure, they've done some tests um, where they, they uh, with AgriLife, and they showed a patch where they had solarized and then a patch that they hadn't solarized. And, the, and then let it just sit there for a little while, um, months actually. And the, the solarized area had far fewer weeds in it than the unsolarized area. So it doesn't, uh, supposedly it's not really harming the, the beneficial soil organisms too. So that's a good thing. So if you want to show the next slide, Carol. So that just shows where um, I'm using some bricks I had left over from a patio project that were cut. And uh, they're, it's tucking it down all along the edges and it would heat up and get um, you know, beads underneath it during the day. And, um, and then it didn't always dry out every day depending on how hot it was up at top and then it would, it would do that again, so. I was a little bit late getting this one done, so we'll see um, how good it worked. Um, but yeah, Ju July and August are probably your, your best times to be able to do this. And that's some okra growing in the background. So <laughs> go ahead and go to the next one. So then when you get to your end, end of your season, uh, you know, you need to clean up everything really well, uh, any kind of debris that's around. If you've got healthy organic material from your plants that um, uh, are through producing that, you know, don't have any disease on them, don't have any bugs on them, you can till that in. If you've got leaves, um, you can work those in and one thing about, you know, our oak leaves here are pretty sturdy. <laughs> so if you're using oak leaves, it, it could take a while for them to decompose. So um, I bought a leaf mulcher because um, we have oak trees in our yard. And so for making, it's good for composting also. So I will break those leaves down enough to, um, to, to work in the compost as well as to use them um, just as they are rather than waiting for them to compost. Planting cover crops is also a good thing to do at the end of the season and then um, you need to think about crop rotation. Even from year to year you don't want to plant your tomatoes in the same place that you had them in the last year or you're, you know you can lead to the nematode problems. Um, and then also the and I use this is says here at the uh, at the end of the season, but I would um, replenish compost and fertilizer shortly before I plant. Excuse me, Mary. We have a question of why do we have a, a filter in our uh, irrigation systems? Uh, so uh, even with city water, um, there can be sediment in it, and it can plug up your emitters. So, uh, and especially if you're using well water or something like that, um, that that's the reason to to keep the any kind of sediment because your little emitters are you know small holes in the drip irrigation and it'll get them plugged up. So every now and then you have to take the the um, the filter off and clean it. Not very often, maybe once a year or so at least. Okay. Filter unscrews. Yeah. So the screen meshing inside of it can be taken out and washed. Washed. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want to go to the next one then? I think that's uh, pretty much it. Yeah. So if there are any other questions, we're ready. So one of the things I'll say while we're waiting, uh, if there are any yeah, other questions. Well, is uh, that, you know, I- while you, while you were asking about other questions, one came up uh, to further clarify solarization. Um, further clarify solarization in terms of how to do it or 
or or what the purpose of it is and uh, and what does it accomplish? Okay, so the purpose is um, to reduce weeds for one thing. If you've got a lot of weeds growing in an area, it can help reduce those. Um, if you've had some bad, um, if you've had nematodes um, in an area, it can help with killing off the nematodes. Uh, same thing with other types of diseases. If you had, you know, if you had some sort of bugs in there that are going to overwinter in the soil. And, and to then- further clarify, I'm going to ask a devil's advocate question here. Why wouldn't we just keep growing all summer long, Mary? <laughs> well, for one reason, because it gets too darn hot. <laughs> um, and also, but- we it uses way too much water. Um, we're trying to conserve water. Uh, we've had severe droughts. 2011 was one down here. And also the population of Corpus Christi is growing faster than um, our, our water reservoirs are. And in fact, we've had to expand pipelines to three neighboring communities to try and supply the city. And just to avoid you know being this monster that hoards water from all of the surrounding communities we would rather just conserve water and it just takes way too much water to try and grow vegetables during the hot summer months yeah the only thing that uh, i had this summer was okra yeah and I, actually it's still growing and still producing and but i've been fighting aphids on it <laughs> that's the other thing the bugs love the summer and the and the vegetables really don't yield when it's that hot so you're just keeping them alive so that they yield again in the fall, but by then they're totally infested. Yeah. Anyhow, I'll stop interrupting now. <laughs> uh, there was one comment, but I don't think it's a question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, we didn't, when we were talking about the amount of light, this is a new toy I've gotten. It's a light meter that you can stick in the ground and uh, I haven't used it yet but because I've got um, fences close to some areas and I'm kind of trying to figure out how much light I'm going to have. So I'm going to use this uh, and um, figure out if I'm going to have adequate light in a couple of areas to actually plant. Oh, I was starting to say um, that, you know, it's all learning. I've made, you know, I planted stuff too close together, you know, and you think, okay, well, and I planted beans last year and they all germinated, came up fine, but, you know, then they just pooped out. So, uh, and then Kevin has told us, well, nobody was having much luck with beans last year, this past spring. Um, So it's all a big learning experience. I used to look on it as failure. Now I just look at it as an opportunity to to, uh, learn something else. Can I ask a question, Mary? Sure. This is Margaret Jordan. I've grown okra um, for many, many years in the past, but I hadn't in the last five years until this season. And someone, an an elderly man in his late 80s, told me, well, when it gets really hot and the oat, your, your plants quit producing as much, cut the middle, you know, cut the main stalk out. I've never done that and I haven't done mine yet because I planted, I had planted mine in like two weeks stations. So I'm getting some um, first time okra off of four of the plants. Mm -hmm. So what's your opinion on that or have you done that? I actually did that. Uh, This was only the second time I'd grown okra. And um, so it also, it got laid over by um, Hannah and Mm -hmm. I staked it back up and it was really tall. It was, I don't know, probably seven, eight feet tall. And then um, because with the aphids and stuff, it was dropping some leaves in the middle. Mm-hmm. And um, so probably, I don't know, maybe a month or so ago, at least, I whacked it off in the middle because uh, okay. someone had told me that you could do that because I was noticing that it was starting to relieve from the bottom. Mm-hmm. And so I just whacked it off and it's been doing great. Okay, well, I'll try it when I get home. I'm out of town, but when I get home, I may try that. Thanks. I just had never heard that and never done it personally. 
from personal experience. So I thought, well, I better ask before I do it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, the, it was interesting because uh, I'm on a, one of the uh, Facebook groups and one of them that had fallen over pretty badly, I went ahead and cut off and I noticed that it really started, you know, bushing out again from the bottom. Hmm. And so I thought, hmm, can I do that to the rest of them? <laughs> <laughs> and I asked on this group and all these people chimed in and said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good thing to do. Thank you. Mary, Carol, y'all got any more uh, wisdom? You've been at this a lot longer than I have. <laughs> well, like you say, lots of failures, but it's experience, right? And like, same with you, my beans this year came up great, beautiful bean plants, never flowered, never produced. Don't know why. I, I have no clue. So, you know, but you work them back into the soil and there you go, nitrogen. So, <laughs> I don't know. But that's, I guess, about all we have. I hope someone... I hope everyone learned something and uh, um, just stay at it. Yeah, Maybe have fun. Friday, Thanks. we're going to turn cooler. Yay. Yay. <laughs> yeah, I get a big, I get a big thrill out of cooking food I've grown. Yes, I canned about, gosh, about 36 jars of pickles this spring from my cucumbers y'all did a great job and i learned more about irrigation than two previous irrigation presentations so oh, carol great carol yeah. did a great job thank y'all great great class thank you thank you for the class thank you very much was in attendance thank you all Everybody was in attendance. I will be sending you an email with the PowerPoint and the handout so you don't have to go to VMS. Everybody else will have to go to VMS. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Thank Vince. You. That's awesome. And Mary S., Hi, everything you said about diseases was spot on. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. I'm beginning to see a pattern. Okay, Thank we don't have any more plan. classes left, guys. So uh, the 9th of November is your exam. Uh, I got an email today from Sandra Wilson. Uh, her and Linda are co-coordinators on the VMS. And what they're noting is many of, and I'm not saying it's you, but many of the interns have not logged in yet much less entered any hours. You need to have 50 volunteer hours and 60 EU hours in order to be certified. You'd like to do that before the class completes. Okay? So if you haven't logged on, log in, establish a password, and then start putting your hours in. 50 hours, volunteer, six CEUs. If you need help, get a hold of me and I'll help you out. Okay. What, what test are you talking about? <laughs> Do what now? What test are you talking about? Oh, you didn't know about the final exam? Uh, there was never one brought up that I know of. Uh, well, uh, maybe I let the cat out of the bag. There is a final exam. And what kind of format is it going to be? Hopefully it's going to be, if it's green, do we keep it? It's, it's uh, various questions is some multiple choices, some fill in. Uh, I don't remember any matching. Uh, and I think it's less than 100 questions. Are we doing it online? So you got two hours. I mean, how much more time do you need? It'll be online or we go somewhere? Um, I don't know because we've never done the course online before. Uh, it's always been in person in the past. Uh, we may have to do a thing where you make an appointment and come into Robstown to take it. I, I don't know. 
uh, what in the, in the past it has been open notes, open book. Um, or some years it has been only your master gardener manual. So if you have not purchased your manual yet, make sure you get it. Okay, Can we suggest that maybe we do it at the botanical garden over like a, you know, if we're going to do appointments, like when we picked up our notebooks from Kevin, there was plenty of table space to do four or five of us at one time in there. Yeah. Two, um, hour, two hour long test is going to take a while though. We'll find out from Kevin and let you know. Uh, just start sweating between now and November <laughs> 9th. And we'll, we'll let you know. We'll let you know when you sign in on the, on the 9th of November what kind of test it is. Oh, no. That's a lot of anxiety. Right. The, only, the only question I remember is like, and they've changed the question since I since I tested out because I last year's test was nothing like the test I took. But the one of the questions I remember from my test was name four varieties of turf grasses that grow in our area. And that Beth, was a fill in the blank. Beth, Green grass, brown grass, semi brown <laughs> grass, and semi -grass. <laughs> dead grass, cut grass. <laughs> So the answer is St. Augustine, Zoysia, Bermuda grass, and you can have a, you have a choice then of seaside pest pollen or buffalo grass. I can remember buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Don't sweat it. You'll do just fine. And uh, just to let you know, we had a very successful uh, plant sale. Uh, we're over 4,000, and we still have enough yet. So thank you, Vince. We'll see you next Monday for the next class. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Enjoy. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey. Bye. bye. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, to I, the presenters. I visited with John today.